Great, thanks. All right, we're ready. Uh, we're live. Hello, welcome everyone to the 2021 Young Playwrights Group Showcase. What a year. These remarkable young people have been meeting several times a month to talk, to plan, to create, to revise, to consider, to support one another. And they've been doing this under the esteemed leadership and loving direction of the remarkable teaching artist, Noel Gusani. So they'll be presenting their work tonight here in our Zoom theater. And we're very thankful that you can join us. So on behalf of TDF, welcome. And Noel, over to you. Thanks, Ginger. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, so grateful to have you all and so grateful to have all our wonderful young playwrights here. Um, I'm just going to briefly share that um, throughout this year, we've been working on Zoom and these incredible young playwrights um, ages 15 to 18 have been meeting every Thursday consistent, um, envisioning audio plays, writing plays, poetry, animation. We've really just opened up the box to all forms of performative writing um, through the limitations of, of, with the limitations of technology. And everyone has created incredible work, been so supportive um, and just all their voices really shine through their work, which you're gonna to see today. Um, so, so excited uh, for you to be here and to see that work. We also have two incredible actors joining us. Um, we had a very brief rehearsal yesterday. We have Ryan Duncan and Aaron Pettigrew, um, wonderful, wonderful um, professional performing artists who are here to support and, and um, speak some of our students' beautiful words. So um, we have nine students sharing today and they will be introducing themselves. I'm gonna start off with our um, first student. Our first piece is um, from Sylvie Stein coming out of the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And we can all turn off our videos and pass it over to Sylvie. Uh, hi, my name is Sylvie Stein. Uh, I use she, her pronouns and I am in 12th grade at Hunter College High School. Um, the piece I'm presenting is the opening monologue for my play, Gold Digger, which was inspired by the work of Susan Laurie Parks. The play itself addresses themes of greed, morality, and self-compromise. And in this monologue, I wanted to explore the philosophy of a character who does society's dirty but in-demand work. Thank you, Sylvie. We have an excerpt from Grave Digger. Lights up. We see a man digging. He is covered in dirt. It is night and he stands in a cemetery. He sings. Oh, a grave digger, he can't complain. The business is going out of style. Thank God for every ache and pain. It's more than your clients will have for a while. <laughs> bury him shallow, bury him deep. First is too mellow, the second's too key. He stops to always... his brow and leans on a gravestone. Oh. <clears throat> they always want it back. Bury Aunt Ruby in her finest clothes, the earrings dripping with diamonds, the dress stitched with gold fabric, all dolled up for the funeral like her niece's wedding. Let her lie in the ground for six days, not sooner. Don't want to disrespect the dead. No later. No one wants clothes that smell like a corpse. Then they go down and get it all back. You only wear a dress once before you wash it anyway. He mops his brow again and bangs his shovel against the tombstone to get some dirt off. Then he returns to digging, singing again. Son's got to take what the father don't provide. A dead man has no use for a pile of gold. So if you said you'd take it with you, you lied. And your grandkids will know it. Before your body's cold. If 
you do it to yourself, you're a monster. Dear old Pop should be left alone to lie in state, even with his fancy gold pocket watch in his breast pocket. A watch that will never tick again, unless it's got human hands to wind it. <laughs> so, I'm your friendly neighborhood grave robber. And you look the other way when I walk down the street, but everyone in this town knows that when that time comes, their kids will be knocking on my door. You don't get too much say in things when you're dead. <laughs> Some things, yeah, but not all of them. His shovel hit something with a loud thunk. He stopped uh, digging. We don't bury him deep the first time. The second time, sure. Naked body in a box. No one's got to know. <laughs> No one wants to know. They want to believe grandma lies dead like she lived. Curled hair, fake nails, nice red lipstick, and all her pretty things around her. The funerals around here are beautiful. The uh, undertaker doesn't like me too much on account of how he can't exactly take pride in the longevity of his work. But if you want your art to last, I tell him, you should build a cathedral. <laughs> the dead don't lie forever. And the worms don't care much for the taste of money. Mike pauses, tilting his head up as though in deep thought or in prayer. He hums a little and sings the final lines of his song. Mm. Everyone knows who bleeds, knows what greed can do. But the grave digger knows it better than you. He disappears into the grave, blackout. Beautiful work, Sylvie. Thank you. Round of applause, snaps for you. Um, thank you for the wonderful performance, Ryan. Our next artist is Miosori Polanco, coming out of Jamaica, Queens. Um, Mio, I'm gonna pass it over to you. Hi, um, like Noel said, my name is Mia Sori. I'm from Queens, New York. Um, I'm 18 years old and I'm a senior at Frank Sinatra School of the Arts and my pronouns are she, her. Um, for my piece, I decided to make a video centering around themes like the universe and existentialism, um, reality and what time actually means, whatever that phrase actually means. Um, and I wanted to add a visual to a voiceover of my work. Uh, I basically sat down in like three or four different writing sessions and I tried to depict a different emotion that came up for me when I thought of the universe in each of the pieces that I wrote and then I put them all put them all together in this video um, and sticking to my theme of time a lot of the footage you'll see is of time lapses um, in nature or just in my life and just what came to mind for me when I thought of those themes. I talked to the sun today. She was early to our meeting, as she usually is. Whereas she takes her slot in the sky as soon as it's her turn, I seem to wait for something to pull me up and out of bed every morning. She smiled at me as I rushed to see her. A smile that said, we both know I love you regardless, but wouldn't you love yourself just a little bit more if you were on time? She's right. I won't admit it, though. I used to think I was silly for having deep conversations with celestial beings until I realized there is no greater response than that of total silence. You see, the sun doesn't speak to me, and yet she holds all my secrets in a treasure chest bathed by her rays of light. Only feelings can be received from a conversation with her. Crippling happiness, hopeless nostalgia, 
and a never-ending need to burn with light from the inside out. When I am confronted with something larger than myself, such as her, I either soak up their glory in a slew of rapid-fire questions, or I shrink under the sheer enormity of everything they are that I am not. The sun knows this about me. She doesn't chastise me for my actions, but makes sure I feel their weight. That's what she does. I talked to the sun today, and her silence said everything I needed to hear. And soon after that conversation I had, I started to realize how temporary life really is. You never see it in the moment because you're too busy feeling extreme highs and lows of happiness punctuated with a whisper of rest. I'm tired of questions about the future. The universe in all her light and darkness and reckless abandon has the fate of my existence between the palm of her hand and that of the stars. I'm angry at her, but not angry enough to forget how to live every day more than anything. Because you need to live with every single nerve in your body. And I ask myself, and everyone else, what makes you come alive? What keeps you up at night? If you died tomorrow, would you feel accomplished? How do you treat people? What do you want to be remembered for? I have a theory that the universe is an artist, perhaps a tortured one whose poems claw their way out of her throat. Or maybe she's the kind of artist whose brushstrokes come easier to her than summer rain. I say this because there is no other explanation for something so beautiful, yet so painfully earth-shattering as our existence. Other than that, it is art molded by the hands of an artist. I am both at the mercy of the universe and the universe in and of itself. I contemplate this paradox of time and space as I stand frozen in it, forbidden from moving back and too afraid to keep moving forward. Am I in complete control or do I have none at all? I struggle to accept both these realities simultaneously because it does not fit my mold. I know how that sounds. How dare I be angry at something as old and as wise as the universe because it hasn't bent to my wishes and desires. I reserve the right to be angry until something makes sense. And I know our lives are an ever-growing kaleidoscope of art, old and new, bought and borrowed, stolen and missing, they're all pure masterpieces, but they're perfect because they're flawed. A painting with tear stains tells a more interesting story than the one with the glossy finish. And so in my mind, there the universe stands, with a shirt sewn with a million lifetimes, picking up her brush again, but this time, to paint us. I wonder how long it will take for our colors to once again fade into the background. I wonder how long it will take for our infinity to be behind us, retreating into our past. Wow.
Really beautiful work, Mio. And um, thank you for these meditations and reflections um, about you and us as, as humans in relation to the universe and the beautiful imagery. Um, thank you so much. Congratulations. Um, our next writer um, also has some reflections on uh, life and death. Wait, do I have Kayla? Do I have you next or do I have Arno next? <laughs> I saw you jumped up. <laughs> I think I have Arno. I think I have Arno and then you're after, right? Yep. Okay, cool. No worries. But beautiful to see your face. Um, so um, this next writer also has reflections uh, on life and death, um, but with uh, his own tone and process. So I'm going to welcome Arno Zeng coming out of Sunset Park, Brooklyn, to share a little bit about his book. So yeah, uh, like when Anola said, my name is Arnold Zhang, and I pronounce it for he and him. I'm, come from, I'm coming from Brooklyn, New York. I'm a junior at Brooklyn Tech Ball High School, and my piece is called uh, Life and Death. And this piece was inspired by uh, Susan Laurie Park to challenge the uh, rule and thinking of society. Great, thank you, Arno. Um, in a forest, between the land of barren waste and the land of luscious greenery, tree loomed overhead. Bird of different color flew around, barren trees also played throughout, corpses of animals also laid about. Among them were death and life, life with the genuinely playful eyes, but you can catch a bit of harshness. She laid about on the grass wearing a flowery dress and a plant imprint on her neck. Leaning on the barren tree is death with his ragged clothes with a scythe imprinted on his hand. Hey, isn't it death? <laughs> you doing good? Ah, funny for you to say, death ain't ever good. The humans have made that pretty clear over the century. Death the evildoer, killer of the living, the grim reaper, soul devourer. Am I ever good? Hell no, I'm evil. I kill people. It's my duty as the force of this world. Not that I hate it. It's just my duty. Ever since I was born, my power leaked out, killing everyone and everything. Am I good? I think not. <laughs> Sheesh. Well, I, I only asked if you were good. Die mortalis. Do I seem good, Miss Admired by All? Oh, well, my job is just to grant life and sustain them. And, and you, you go around concibito cadentes, my creations gone. I mean, why do you think people like me more but hate you? Because you are a beautiful lie, while I am the painful truth. You think life and love is great and all, but no, it's just pain in the end, all pain. Only I, mortem, am eternal rest. Well, you ain't wrong. <laughs> well, like you said, it is your duty. So now, let me go back to my place and work on my job. I'll see you around, Death. Life opens a green portal and steps through it. Oh, let me go back to my place and work blah, blah, blah. Death opens his dark portal and takes out his tablet to observe his list of people to kill. Death looks at the list and sighs steps through the portal to his domain. With the tablet in one hand, he raises his other hand. By the laws of the gods, your soul shall be passed to the afterlife. Your life is over, but you shall live here. So heed death's call, join me, for I'll make it painless. The gateway doors open, souls of people, millions of souls, kids walked through. But kids, 
Death quickly double, double checks his tablet. No, am I not mistaken? Kids, 90,000 of them. My power isn't going haywire, right? Death went to glance in the mirror. All he sees is a kid covered with blood. What he always sees, he sighs. Scene two, in the human world, ill. The kids were bedridden for many weeks, surrounded for many weeks by dark haze, refusing to eat, to drink, to talk. Everyone was worried, especially the mayor. Doctor. Doctor, doctor. Tell me. Tell me my son is all right and that he'll be fine. I, I can't say for certain. I've never seen this disease. We need to consult the goddess of life. Right away. Men, gather the people. After you, good doctor. The doctor ran out. The mayor and his men ran out. People began to follow to the temple of life. Give me the offering. Guard one hands him the plate of fruit and food. Oh, goddess of life, tell us why our children are plagued with this disease and how we can solve this disease. A projection, just like a reflection, life comes out. Dear humans, we meet again. As for this matter of disease, I cannot help you. They are already in too deep and death's aura already appeared on them. I can't do anything. Life's image simmers, then disappears. My son, my, my son. He's my daughter, my son is there too. My son. What about my son? Mr. Mayor, your son, he is gone. No. No, it. Death. You heard the goddess of life. Death's aura was on them. It's his fault. We've been tolerating him for far too long. He thinks he can kill us all? We'll storm his temple. The angry mob marched with the mayor toward the temple of death. The people tore up everything in the temple, kicked his offering, beginning to tear down the temple. Death felt a disturbance in his soul. Out he went to his temple, or where his temple was supposed to be, and there was nothing. You peasants! You think that you are almighty? With a fling of his hand, the people were blown against the wall. People were horrified, cowering in fear as death raised his hand again. He stopped and lowered his hand and looked at himself and then at the people. You people are ruthless. I only did my job, and yet you stormed my temple and destroyed the only few offerings I have just because I took your people. You all fear me and my power. I came to terms with that, and yet you still go further to denounce me and curse my name and my power? Death ain't evil. Death is the last peace, the thing that makes life important. Yet all they call me is monster. Life ain't pretty either. She just keeps bringing more and more beings into this world, setting them up for death. But do they call her a monster? I think not. In fact, those deaths, I had to clean up. I clean up her creations, yet I'm evil. Death paused and looked down. People looked at him in confusion. Was it not his fault? Why should I be the villain in all your stories? Why should I do the thing that you all despise? Why should I care about this world? Since you think I'm evil, then so be it. I'll take myself and go. Along with my feared power of death. You and your people will never hear from this man. This man you cursed and called a monster. A monster named Death. Be free as you wish. For today I, Death, will release you from my grasp. With that, Death just disappeared, along with the remains of his ruined temple as if it were never there. Life took over, no one died, but with just life, no one felt anything.
Beautiful work, Arno. Thank you for sharing this piece. And um, I'd like to offer a reflection that some of the work that we were studying, um, both Arno's development around this death monologue, as well as Sylvie's first piece around Gravedigger were inspired from some of our work with Susan Laurie Parks, as they both mentioned, we were reading her red letter plays and looking at the question of um, the character Hester, who performs abortions for the society and is looked down on and this question of what does it mean to be the character that people look down on and why and um, what is that reflecting and showing about the society and how is that a mirror of, of many questions of morals and ethics and blame and greed and power in the society. Um, so just really appreciate both your, um, everybody's work, but Arno and, and Sylvie specifically looking at those themes inspired by Susan Laurie Park's work and just seeing these, these incredible manifestations of, of those themes. Um, so great work. And um, now I'm gonna introduce our next writer um, who's gonna be performing their work, uh, which is Kayla Morgan. Hey Kayla, I'm gonna pass it over to you. Hi everyone, I'm Kayla Morgan. I'm a poet in Brooklyn, New York, and I started writing at eight years old. And since then, I've never stopped. I believe in the importance of expressing one's identity creatively, that sharing your words and thoughts can leave an everlasting hold on the audience. The pieces that I'm performing are part of a portfolio called Poetic Lineage and details my experiences with other important people in my life and with myself deeply because things in this world are not surface level. They have layers and depths, beautiful and ambiguous. I will perform my pieces now. A bipolar ritual, mother-daughter bond. My mother plucks the yellow petals off the marigolds of her life, leaves the remnants on her soul's funeral pyre. She recites chants for abandonment, requests to be forsaken with her clasped hands, unbinds crosses and idols from her altar, replaces them with scars forged from fingernails scraped against her scarlet skin. Bitter crimson gushes out from the omen lines on her palm. Bitter crimson carves her cryptic language onto my concertated throat. Brutal as the flame blade wounding her blind eyes, concussing my body as it decays into a corpse. Her bloody mumbles of mental misery keep my soft bones as relics. The indigo cries hollering within my hollow body as her ghost haunts me collecting my scrapes of sanity, turning them into ashes. I implore purified prayers, exorcisms for my mother's plague, a curse that is also engraved in my own damn tomb as I find myself plucking the same solemn Mary goats. <laughs> April 28th, 2004, bloodline death at childbirth. One, I see my father's reflection in mirrors. He glances at how my mother's womb had conceived me. Beloved spring baby birthed with a trivial backbone in her last name. I wonder if he notices the inborn bloodshed from my skeleton scent, and that it was him who peeled off my bone marrow like he does with perfected peppers, cleaved and carved into a ceramic of curry, neglecting the canola oil mundane molds, fermenting and the famine of his fatherly instinct too. I ponder about why he recalls for me like foreign spices when he discerns me in his reflection, his fluorescent daughter. He won't seize his parental massacre present in yonder, the poignancy intensifying and my melancholy three. I will even savor tasteless justice if he respected me as he does ripen plantains, the ones he personally picked from the homeland and how he dresses them. His bundle of joy, an African pottery of cayenne and ceramic powder, heredity sizzling in the juice of grated ginger root, cuisine of kernel unraveled, the satisfaction and victory beaming in his blood. Four, he spits vex lineage at the smoky ashes from my spine, bogging his mirror. I paint prime essence with my blood on the glass, hoping for resurrection, or maybe a eulogy. 
but my bones know that the reality is like the birth of charred Okara in the homeland, fatal exile. Validation unlayered. I weave pieces of mulberry silk and baby cashmere into my starlight veil. My ego embellishes it with embroideries. South Sea pearls and painite crystals, additional touches of sequins sewed from yarns of Acuna wool. I risk severed fingers and labored thoughts for grand divinity. Curtsies and standing ovations heightening for me, like the vibrations surrounding a queen bee. Here, I lavish in threads of royalty and purple perfection, pickpocketing the essence under the veil for it. But suppose my cover has slipped in from grace. They discover that in their colorist needlework, where judgment is artistry and the reflection of a burlesque dancer, their eyes fixed on the swaying of white feathers under guanco under linen, regal gilds, warming the essence underneath. And notably, Suppose they discover the essence is a seamstress who sweat bleeds out of her endeavored heart, and that mundane venom is her flair, as she triple crochet cotton blankets, one yard over nullity, needle intertwining rejection. Thank you, Kayla. Mm. Um, Kayla, can you stay on the screen actually with me for a second? That would be great. Just so, just to share a reflection. Um, thank you for your full hearted um, being and performance and for sharing so much imagery that takes us deep into the crevices and expanding into lineage. Um, your words are so powerful and um, I feel like each line could be sat with for an eternity. Um, so thank you so much for sharing and um, and so grateful to be graced with, with your presence and poetry um, this year. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, our next writer is Darlisha Adames uh, coming out of East New York, Brooklyn. Darlisha, I'm gonna pass it over to you. Hi, my name is Darlisha Adamas and my pronouns are she, her, and I'm a senior in high school. My piece is inspired by an exercise we did in class where we played around with surrealism and realism images and wrote short monologues based on these images. I did something similar to that, but in my piece, I'm exploring with love and the images and, and pieces of writing all revolve around love and everything in between. I think it was easier to put all my attention and energy towards you, the less time I would have for me and my problems. But I think when you no longer were able to fill that void, I no longer needed you. And I guess you can call me selfish for saying that. But just know that I'll miss you and the way your lips felt on mine, and how patient you were with me. I hope one day I learn how to love myself just as much as you loved me. A puppet to my inner demons, destroying everything around me. Cigarettes, damage to my lungs, making it hard to breathe. Unfortunately, damage is all I know. Maybe one day I'll learn how to love myself as much as you loved me, or maybe even more. I look back at old pictures and videos and I wish I could go back in time just to appreciate what was in front of me. I notice every little detail, so when the time flies by, I can close my eyes and relive those moments again. And yesterday would be a waste if I don't love you like I'm supposed to. I wish loving you wasn't painful. Son las dos de la mañana y yo pensando en ti. I don't want to be scared to love anymore. Time needs to slow down so I can catch up, but like I'm still trying to figure out what to do with my life. Remember that healing takes time. Why is it so hard to explain how I feel sometimes?
To my future lover, sometimes I think about you and I try to imagine how my life would be. I think about traveling, having many adventures with you. Sometimes I think about how hot you are. You better be hot. Bro, you better be so hot that when I look at you, it makes me want to have your kids and forget the pain I would go through when giving birth. And if you ever try to leave me, I will make sure to make your life a living hell. <laughs> Just kidding. LOL. Anyways, I hope that I fall in love with you so bad that I changed my mind about marriage so we can have a wedding in Thailand and I can have a pretty dress on by a famous designer and everyone will be talking about how beautiful I am. Also, at some point in our relationship, I want to get mad at you so we can reenact the scene in the movie 10 Things I Hate About You, where you write a poem about 10 things you hate about me, but it's actually a poem about 10 things you love about me. And then I'll stop being mad at you and we'll start kissing and then you can take me on vacation. And just FYI, if our love is not like the love in the movie, The Notebook, then I don't want it. Why do you ask? Because I deserve it. Anyways, bye, bestie. Love you. Hope to see, I hope to see you in like about five years. Sincerely, your lover. How beautiful it is to be surrounded by a mother's love so often overlooked, but she does not need to boast for when she loves, she does it out of the goodness of her heart. She protects from the strength of her bones and everything she does, she does it with grace. A love worthy of praise. What a blessing it is to be surrounded by a mother's love. Thank you, Darlisha. Beautiful, beautiful work. So lovely to hear it in everybody's voices and just so appreciate how you stuck with something and this idea that we talked about with visual imagery and how that struck you and, and allows you to write very freely and finding that, that through line. And so I just appreciate you sharing that and bringing that dynamic of your voice of the visual and, and the writing together. And we see how different these monologues and voices come up around love. Such great work. Thank you. Um, our next writer is also an incredible visual artist, um, introducing Helene Rudich coming out of Kew Gardens, Queens. Hi, I'm Helene. I'm a senior at the High School of Fashion Industries, and my pronouns are she, her. So this piece is a little snippet of a longer play that I wrote called Ace Acrobat. And it's about this high class British girl who joined the circus and falls in love with her acrobatic partner, but she realizes that she might not be so into the sexy part of love. Okay, so we jump at the same time, then you grab my hands in the middle and unhook your feet from the bar, got it? I think so. All right, three, two, one, jump! You did! Yeah! <sighs> okay, I'm gonna swing you to my side and you land on the platform, okay? Okay. Rose! Rose, are you okay? Yeah, just had the wind knocked out of me. You're right, this is soft. So you told you you'd be okay? We should probably take a break for now, huh? Sounds like a good idea. Thank you. Good morning, my flower. Oh, stop. Are we still on for tomorrow night? Yep. And I got something really special planned for after. And what might that be? Oh, you want a preview? Sure. You're blushing. If you're too excited, we can move my special surprise to tonight. No, I mean, I don't want to ruin our special date. Very well, my flower. What am I doing? I should be all over him by now. We've been dating for months. It took so long to find someone who understands me and lets me be free not to mention actually likes me. So why don't I want to have sex with him? 
Is there something wrong with me? Should I go to the doctor? No. What if mother was right? Maybe I do belong in a madhouse. No! I'm sane. Mothers would beg to have daughters like me, especially with all the sluts I've had to engage with during those stupid dinner parties. No chance of any bastards with me, that's for sure. It's my mother who's crazy, trying to marry me off as fast as she can. Who wouldn't want a daughter who's eager to wait? That's it. I'm just waiting. I'm just waiting for a ring. That's all. A proposal and a wedding. That's all I need to get me in the mood. That's perfectly normal. I'm perfectly normal. I'll tell him tomorrow before rehearsal. That that's the only way he'll get me in bed is with a diamond. And just imagine having a Mr. and Mrs. Acrobat show as part of the circus. We'll make thousands of pounds a day. Yeah. This will be great. Ooh, incredible, Helene. Amazing to also just again, as I've been saying with, with so many of you, seeing your unique voice, both in writing and your artistry and bringing that together to create a whole experience of, of storytelling. And I'm just so excited for you. I know we have a few of you who graduated or are graduating next week. I know you just had your graduation yesterday. So, and you're going to fashion, you're going to FIT, right? Amazing. So just so excited to see what your next steps are and your growth as, as an artist, um, as a visual artist, as a fashion artist, as a writer. Thank you so much for sharing your, your powerful work. Um, and our next writer is Miles Weedman coming out of the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Hello, um, I'm Miles. My pronouns are he, him, and I'm a rising junior at the repertory company high school for theater arts and my piece is sort of a collection of many things i wrote um throughout the year all around themes of time and sometimes feeling stuck and so special thanks to my friends who helped me record this and here it is on a page I rise. I am a broken metronome. Out of sync. Deep breath. Out of time with the wind. The sound of laughter echoes, so distorted I feel it all around me, in me. Could it be mine? I don't know. I think maybe it was once. I rise, another paragraph closer to something, stanza after stanza falls behind me as each page turns, suspense building indefinitely towards something. And I am the ellipses. I am the moment before, more than just build up, but I am not the climax. Still, all eyes are on me as I reach out towards something. I have risen. Is it time for me to fall? When I close my eyes, I am weightless. I'm tethered. I feel the weight of the sky on top of me. I do not carry it. Let it collapse like a circus tent. It doesn't matter. It will not crush me. How could it when I am a syncopated rhythm? When I am nothing more than a few strokes of ink on a page? I rise, deep breath in my own measure. I don't wait for the wind to catch up. The laughter echoes in my ears, through my bones. My arms spread out like wings, ready for a climax. It doesn't come. My fingers grasp at nothing but clouds. I stay balanced, stuck on the ledge. The air is still, the ground far below me silent. It's fine, I can wait, it's all I've ever done.
it commands me so well. That firm tone grips me with such ferocity that I believe every word. In those moments, it feels as though I am seeing clearly when normally I am so blind, and that terrifies me. So I long desperately to see things like before while telling myself that to hope is blindness. But in the moments of peace, the moments where there is hope, I look back and see a manic distortion of myself, manipulated by darkness to see what isn't there. I see through these two lenses, one that supposedly hides the truth from me and the other that twists it into falsehoods. I fear I don't know which one is right. I cast my question, my doubt, with abandon into deep black waters and get no response. The universe tells me to be more patient, and so I wait. I don't have a choice. I wonder how long I have been here. Time has not been kind to me lately. I rise. I don't think the answer is coming. Not yet, considering how time passes. Patience is a virtue afforded only to those who know there is something worth waiting for. I need an ending. I'm tired of waiting. I'm standing on the tipping point. Something, just please come and push me. Come on, I need to know who's right. I can't trust anything they say, anything I think anymore. I can't bear the noise. It's too much. I need an ending. Please. The wind blows through me, past me. I don't know the difference. Past and future have no meaning anymore. Laughter still echoes. The noise of my heart drowns it out. It's all the same. Everything is different. Nothing makes sense. Nothing makes sense. Need an ending. Need an... Another page turns. Do we ever get closer, do you think? I stand in the epicenter of my life, and I am a million miles away. I know you, I am you, and I will never meet you. Does that answer your question? Concurrent contradictions. Simultaneous existences. They talk together in a bedroom. Thirteen walks around, sixteen watches from the bed. The room is a mess of memories, an entire life of knickknacks and photographs. I think they understand. It's so full. No point in leaving it empty. I live here. Might as well have fun with it. But what if there are new things you want to add someday? I'll let Seventeen deal with that. He's smarter than I am. I'm pretty smart too, you know. Yeah. I know. For a moment, the clocks tick in unison. Pulses harmonize in a percussive chorus. I just wish I could see things the way you do. You'll be just like me soon enough. Then who will you be? I don't know. Maybe we can ask Seventeen together. Hand in hand, they exit. Time pauses. Time repeats. Time goes on. Wonderful work, Miles. Mm, beautiful, poetic meditation on time. I'm just thinking these all these existential questions that come up from the pieces. Um, and I remember this, this was originally inspired by, we were reading some Samuel Beckett and, um, and looking at these audio plays and, and that exploration of this metronome and this time and, and, how time moves and what it means. Just so appreciate your poetry, um, your continual reflections, your voice, and and how you always bring us into another another space and dimension with your words. So thank you for the beautiful sharing. And um, our next writer is Beckett Quirk, coming out of Chelsea, Manhattan. Beckett, I'm gonna pass it over to you. Uh, yeah, I'm Beckett. Um, my pronouns are he, him. I'm. I'm a junior at St. Anne's in uh, Brooklyn. That's my school. Um, and I'm showing a few scenes uh, from a play I'm working on. Uh, yeah. One. 
I watched a film the other day. It was about people my our age. I don't remember the name or the plot particularly well because it was all drowned out by the kissing and the singing and the fighting and the screaming and the crying and all that kind of stuff. And there was this one scene I saw that I keep remembering where this guy, he kept on splashing the girl in the movie because they're at the beach and the ocean. And then, well, they, you know. Kissing? Kissing. Yeah. And there was some other stuff in between the waves and the kissing, but that's what I keep remembering. Uh, cool. What was the movie called? I don't remember. Hmm. Two, A and B are sitting in the sun at the beach. You were splashing me a lot. In the ocean? Yeah. Yeah. That wasn't, you weren't trying to be like in the movie you talked about. No, no. Because I didn't like the splashing. It made me cold. Colder than just being in the water? Far colder. Wow. Yeah, because okay. it, if you, wanted to kiss with me or, or sing with me, you should just say so. Okay. A young couple, Y and Z, walk on stage in front of A and B in beach attire. They stop downstage and a little stage left of A and B. One of them, Y, gets down on their knees. Will you marry me? Sure. Y stands and the couple continues on. Wow. Huh. Three. B is sitting by the beach on a bench. He is leaning back, looking at the stars. A mad scientist approaches him. Stargazing. Do you see Venus or the Big Dipper? If I remember right, the Cane Benefiti should be rather bright tonight. Just looking at the lights, just taking it in, you know? You seem like a smart kid. Do you have plans for the summer? Well, my parents say that if I work hard enough to, on rowing, I'll be guaranteed to get into UOO, maybe even with scholarship. UOO, that's impressive. I have a lab there. You can be my, re my summer research assistant. I think I'm just gonna focus on rowing this summer, but I like science. Of course. I can guarantee you admission if you work with me. I think I'm okay. What do you research? I'm working on building a bomb, a huge bomb. How big? It could blow up the whole island, and then 10 more islands. Cool. What are you making it for? Nothing, really. Four. The mad scientist lab. B is idly shuffling around vials on a workbench, clearly not doing much. What are you doing over there? Working. On what? Working hard, man. On an answer. Are you doing anything right now? Sorry. Here. Go to the Jacobs lab on the other side of the campus, okay? Look for a key and show him this list. If he's not there, then come back. What if there's someone else? Then come back. B starts to exit. Don't talk to anyone. You hear me? Five. Hey. Did you ever read about the bombs they dropped on us in the 40s? 
I think it was the 80s. Whatever. Did you? Maybe. A lot of people died, right? Probably. But there haven't been a lot of bombing since, which is good. I guess. You guess? <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. End of scene. Thank you, Beckett. We have had incredible conversations about this piece and um, what Beckett is working on and the style and tone and the, your unique voice and the mood. Um, so I know we've dug into that a lot, but um, I'm excited to see how it keeps developing and um, this incredible nuance you have with creating an in, a deep and intense tension underneath the words of the story. Um, so just really powerful work. And um, yeah, look forward to seeing how things develop. Thank you. Um, and our closing playwright of the evening, our closing work is from Nala Bell, um, coming out of the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Nala, I'm gonna pass it over to you. Thank you, Noel. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Nala Bell. I am a rising senior at Repertory Company High School for Theater Arts. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I just wanted to, first of all, say thank you to Noel for uh, keeping this class feeling as authentic as it has, even though we're all on Zoom. Um, the piece that you're about to see is based off of a series of voice memos, um, each in the hour long, that I would just speak for an hour almost every night. And I listened back and I found some through lines. So I decided to write them down. Um, and that's that. Hope you enjoy. I suppose I think a lot. I'm not sure if it's more than most people, but I ponder a lot more than I think my friends do. I don't know if my brain is different or if I hate that idea that my brain could be different. It's weird. It freaks me out. But what if we all have different brains? And if we're all trying to assimilate to each other, thinking you, the individual, are the anomaly, that we're going to become somewhat of a collective, cohesive consciousness. I think that's more of what the collective consciousness is than anything. Some might disagree, but. A collective consciousness doesn't sound like some divine thing. It sounds like the idea that we are in some way the same, but with no evidence to back that. So instead of seeking it out naturally, we've created it and we train our kin into it. And we're all just layered on top of each other. And I feel bad for celebrities because they meet all these people but are expected to stay the same and be a brand, their name becomes a brand. So they don't really have the opportunity to dive into the art. I'll call it that this is the collective consciousness. We have created what it is to be human in some capacity. I think that's where culture comes into play. So many people have never left their country. So how's person A, let's call them Marie, who lives in place one, Going to be like person B, let's call him Tom, who lives in place two. Well, person C, let's call her Susan, who lives next door to Marie, goes on an adventure to place two. And Susan, by some chance or another, meets Tom. So now Tom and Susan have an elaborate romance that takes place over the course of a week and a half. Oh no, Susan has to go home to place one. Susan is now home with Marie in place one, and they catch up over brunch. Get a little too drunk with their bottomless mimosas, and a little too full eating quiche Lorraine and egg white omelets. Now, Susan has successfully introduced Marie to the idiosyncrasies that Susan acquired from Tom. The simple introduction is a seed. Now, every time they see each other, they being Marie and Susan, the seed grows. And every time Marie thinks of Susan, Marie will think of those small idiosyncrasies and eventually pick up on them. And that is the web that is the collective consciousness. I've been thinking a lot about the impact of language, which ties into the collective consciousness idea in some ways but not really. But regardless, the impact of language is honestly fucking insane. Like this summer I had this thing, I would say, 
I would say you're terrible. But I meant you're the best. I thought it was evidently clear. I figured if I was around the people I cared about and they did something, let's say, extremely nice, and I was absolutely elated, smiling, laughing, all of that, well, I figured they clearly understand that I didn't actually mean you're terrible. To a degree, they did. But one night, I was speaking to someone I cared about immensely at the time. Well, that's not fair to say. I was speaking to someone I care a lot about. And they cried. They, they just cried. And they were telling me a lot of what they were feeling. And out of nowhere, they said, and when you call me terrible, it kills me. It kills me. Fucking panic. How could someone I love so much not see that, that they were words of love? Well, like it didn't matter. They knew how I meant it, but it didn't matter because, because those were still the words coming out of my mouth. You're terrible. And, and, I, and I think it took me a lot longer to really start thinking about it. But the impact of language is absolutely insane because it doesn't matter what you mean all the time. You learn words at a young age, terrible equals worse than bad. So when you call someone terrible, like I did, I am then changing the definition completely with no warning, terrible equals the best. And who am I to expect the people around me to add a new definition to their dictionary? And even if they do, the definition they've always used will always reign supreme. So there's an odd negative undercurrent now. I try to be precise in some capacity now. I like to stay consistent and straightforward so that the people around me don't have to play the guessing game. What does that actually mean? Instead, they know what I mean because it's exactly what I've said. I am being consistent with them. I suppose I don't need to, and sometimes I don't do the best job, but I try. I really do try. It breaks my heart. I think I've done so much wrong, and I've started to fix it, or at least fix the parts of myself that were doing the wrong. I think I'm doing a decent job. I try to, but I can't take away the heartbreak. No apology can fix the way I used to make people feel. I didn't even know. I never had a malicious intent. I'm not sure. I wish I could go back in time. But I absolutely don't. Because I'd be just the same. I wish apologies meant something. Something more than what they are. I'm sorry, that, that got dark. Thank you, Nala. Thank you, performers. Um, Nala, it's really wonderful to see your process of taking your inner thoughts and voice recordings and documenting. And, and um, Nala is also an incredible director and um, worked with the actors herself, directing them in terms of how to perform and, and also did that recently a few weeks ago with our Instagram story monologues. So um, your brilliance just shines through Nala. Thank you. Um, I would love to uh, invite all our playwrights to come on video again, uh, just so we can see, see everybody. Um, just give everyone a big round of applause. Um, beautiful, beautiful work, everybody. Um, I was telling uh, a friend actually about, um, about how every year at the showcase and other things like different themes emerge or styles and I was like this year was some really big cosmic questions and a lot of abstraction and existentialism and I was like last year was a different theme there's some years where it's really comedic some years where it's really dark some years where it's really political and um and I know I play a, a role in that but I also feel like going off of Nala's piece and the collective consciousness um your guys connection with each other and even across 
even across technology and Zoom, um, your consistency, your brilliance um, are an inspiration to me every single week. I am so grateful um, to work with each of you. And um, I am so grateful for your visions and voice and beings in the world. Um, you are our future and um, you are the now. And um, for those of you graduating, if you wanna give a special like hands up for those of you who are finishing graduating, wishing you so much love and good good luck and blessings um thank you to our audience for coming through thank you special shout out to ryan and aaron our wonderful actors if you want to show your uh incredible faces thank you thank you so much for constantly showing up for our students and performing their work you guys are brilliant and and bring to life their words and spirit and voice um thank you everybody have a good night for the students if you guys want to stay on the zoom for a second i know we'll we'll shut off from live on YouTube, um, but just for instance, so we can have a little closing together. Thanks everybody.